So today I'm going to talk about the Washington Consensus. And the Washington Consensus is essentially a set of policies advocated by the main international economic institutions based in Washington, D.C. Uh, so these would be the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank in particular. Uh, so the Washington Consensus refers to the policies that these institutions advocated and supported, um, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s. And these policies are based on the orthodox view of development. Uh, so they see development in mainly economic terms, purely economic terms. Um, development is effectively equated with uh, high levels of GDP, with modernization, um, as defined basically by a, a society based on the mass production of consumer goods. Um, and so this is the model of development that uh, the Washington Consensus subscribes to. And the policies they advocate then are, as the orthodox view um, suggests, uh, to be achieved by neoliberal economic policies. So that is, don't forget, neoliberalism is basically the belief in a, a fully free market economy in which the state plays a minimal role in e economics. So there's minimal state intervention in the economy. So this is to be achieved by um, things such as public spending cuts, reductions of public spending, uh, tax cuts, to make sure there's a low level of tax, um, financial liberal liberalization, basically deregulation, um, so reducing regulations on the economy, making it easier for capital, for example, to move across borders, to be invested in different countries, uh, make, uh, make it easier for trade to carry on, so free trade is another policy that forms part of the Washington Consensus. Uh, openness to foreign investment, also referred to as FDI, foreign direct investment, um, and the advocation of privatization. Uh, so instead of having state-owned industries and farms and so on, you have privately owned farms and land and industry and so on and so forth. So really this broad um, set of policies based on a sort of neoliberal view, uh, an orthodox view of development, incorporating the neoliberal um, vision of a fully free market economy in which the state plays minimal role in the economy, that's basically, those policies are collectively referred to as the Washington Consensus because they were agreed upon and supported and pushed by those international economic institutions based in Washington, the IMF and the World Bank in particular. Um, <clears throat> so, the second thing I want to address in this lecture is why has the Washington Consensus and these policies advocated in the Washington Consensus being so controversial um, because they faced a lot of criticism, especially in the late 1990s, there began a movement um, called the, the anti-globalization movement that was really uh, protesting hard against the policies advocated by the IMF and the World Bank. So it was really a backlash against the Washington Consensus. Um, and I'm going to break it down into three main reasons why uh, the Washington Consensus has been so controversial. So the first reason um, was that these policies were effectively imposed on countries of the global south um, by institutions like the IMF and World Bank, which, by the way, the IMF and World Bank, are, as I said, they're based in Washington, which gives you an idea of the kind of um, uh, the forces that are powerful within those organizations. They are mainly led and uh, the policies are driven within those institutions by the leading countries of the global north, so the US, UK and others. So <clears throat> the Washington Consensus policies, the IMF and the World Bank were not simply advocating those policies, um, but they were actually, they made implementation of these policies, which were often put together in, into what were called structural adjustment programs, SAPs, and they made imp implementing these policies a condition of these institutions providing loans to Global South countries. This was especially the case in the uh, 1980s and 90s, as I said. So the situation was that Global South countries were often dependent on these institutions for providing loans. So the IMF would provide short-term loans to cover what are called balance of payments issues. If a country has a kind of cash flow uh, problem, it's effectively the equivalent for a country as what we call payday loans for individuals. If you get to near the end of the month, and you know you've got some more coming in in a few days, but you've got some bills going out, so you get a short-term loan just for a week or so, and to just cover 
cover the gap, if you like. So the IMF provides those short-term loans to countries facing balance of payments problems. The World Bank provides longer-term, what are called development loans, to help actually long-term infrastructure, uh, investment in education and so on in developing countries. So Global South countries are often dependent on these institutions and have been dependent on these institutions for loans, which gives those institutions a great deal of power and leverage over the countries, which are typically countries of the Global South, that they're lending to. Um, so in the 80s onwards, they made implementation of these structural adjustment programs, these Washington Consensus policies, um, a condition of the loan. Um, and because the Global South countries are such desperate need of these loans, they had little choice but to accept the conditions that were attached to them. So that's the first reason for controversy around the Washington Consensus, is that uh, these policies were effectively imposed on the Global South by the financial institutions controlled by the Global North. The second criticism made by, amongst others, former World Bank economist Joseph Stiglitz, are uh, that actually these kind of policies actually increase poverty. They're supposed to uh, reduce poverty, but the argument is actually they, they increase poverty. And they do this for three main reasons. So, firstly, public spending cuts. Now, obviously, if you're cutting spending on healthcare, on education, uh, on welfare, then that's going to have an adverse effect on people dependent on those services. So, this has pushed um, many people in developing countries in the global south into poverty. And arguably this has contributed uh, to the AIDS epidemic um, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa as governments have been forced by the IMF and World Bank to cut back on health provision, cut back on education spending and so on. Um, it also, these policies also seem to increase poverty um, through the imposition of free trade <coughs> on, on countries which often leads to an influx of cheap foreign goods into a country, uh, which puts domestic producers out of business. So for example, following an IMF World Bank imposed structural adjustment program in Ghana, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana was forced to abolish tariffs on imported rice. Tariffs are a tax you charge on goods coming into the country. They were told, no, that's against free trade, you have to abolish them. Um, and so they did, and this led to an influx of cheap mass-produced US rice uh, flooding into Ghana, which obviously had the effect of putting um, Ghana's rice farmers out of business. And this has led to many people in the rice growing areas being forced to um, try to make a living in the, in, the, in the towns, which has led to an increase in very dangerous, very unhygienic slums on the outskirts of cities. There's been this movement of people from the countryside who've been bankrupted um, by, uh, by imported rice, for example, moving from the countryside to the cities, leading to the growth of slums, uh, which are obviously very impoverished, uh, miserable places to live. And thirdly, um, poverty can be increased by Washington consensus policies um, through foreign investment. Foreign investment is encouraged by the Washington consensus, um, which can be beneficial to a country, but it can also result simply in TNCs, Global North usually based uh, transnational corporations, establishing things like mines, uh, plantations, big giant farms basically, or sweatshops, um, uh, very poor conditioned, low wage uh, factories basically, which will exploit the uh, cheap wages of the country, pay very low wages, often have dangerous working conditions, um, and often have very, a very damaging effect on the local environment, causing pollution and so on, which in turn can have a knock-on effect in, on, on, on poverty, if the local environment is destroyed, then obviously that puts other people's livelihoods at risk. For example, local farmers, if rivers are polluted and so on. This has been the case, for example, very famously in Nigeria, in the, in the Niger Delta. Um, Shell oil has, has been widely criticized um, for its very uh, uh, environmentally damaging practices uh, around its oil wells um, in Nigeria. Uh, <coughs> And the third main reason for controversy around the Washington Consensus policies has been that it's based on a flawed model of development. As I said, it's based on the orthodox model of development and it's based on neoliberal policies that argue that a free market economy is the path to prosperity. Now, several people, including, uh, for example, Cambridge economist Hajun Chang, have argued actually that no country in history has ever developed 
using purely free market policies of the type advocated in the Washington Consensus. If you look at the world's leading uh, developed economies, the USA, the UK, Japan, Germany, all of them when they industrialized and developed in the 19th century, all of them heavily relied on protectionist policies where the state was very much involved in helping certain industries to develop. Uh, so they didn't develop through kind of opening themselves up to all kinds of foreign competition and, and so on. They didn't, they didn't develop using a free market model of develop, they, they, development. They developed using a uh, very protectionist model of development where the state was guiding industrial uh, investment decisions, um, it was subsidizing certain companies, it was protecting uh, what are called infant industries from foreign competition and so on. Uh, the same applies even to the East Asian tiger economies of the 1980s, South Korea, Taiwan, um, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. And also applies to China in the 2000s, um, which all followed, again, heavily state-directed strategies uh, of economic development, involving protection of their infant industries, that's their kind of industries in the early stages of growth, and protecting those industries until such time as they were ready to compete on a global market. They didn't simply, as the IMF and World Bank advocated, throw open their economy to total foreign com competition all at once. They didn't do that. And the title of Hajun Chang's books on the subject, Bad Samaritans, referring to the IMF and World Bank, uh, and kicking, kicking away the ladder, um, imply that actually the Washington Consensus policies are imposed by the Global North uh, not to help the South develop, but precisely to prevent the Global South countries emerging um, as, as economic rivals to the developed economies of the Global North.